Hi, I'm Chuck Stout, curator at the Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum, and today we're going to go behind the wings of a twin-engine military transport, the Douglas C-47 Goonie Bird. We're going to talk with a C-47 pilot. We're going to learn about this aircraft's incredible history leading the D-Day invasion in 1944, and then we are going to go fly it. This is going to be cool. It's time to go behind the wings. We're here at Wings Over the Rockies' second location, Exploration of Flight at Centennial Airport. This week, we have a Douglas C-47 Goonie Bird. That's all, brother. Before we get into the history of this particular aircraft, let's talk a little bit about the development of the C-47. It all started with a long phone call. Douglas was producing the DC-2, and sales were good. Several airlines had placed large orders. Douglas had already built almost 100. Other countries were paying Douglas for licensing rights to build DC-2s themselves. The DC-2 could carry 14 passengers, but C.R. Smith, the head of American Airlines, called Don Douglas, the head of Douglas Aircraft, and proposed building a larger version of the DC-2 that could carry 14 people in beds. Well, not exactly beds, but sleeper berths, like on cross-country trains. Douglas was doubtful and argued against it. Smith persisted and two hours later had convinced Douglas to develop a new airliner that could carry 14 people in sleeper berths and a normal passenger version with 21 seats. The sleeper version became the DST for Douglas Sleeper Transport and the passenger version became the DC-3. Within three years, the DC-3 became the most popular airliner in the world and went on to become one of the most successful aircraft in history. With a speed of about three miles per minute, they were fast, comfortable, and beautiful. Meanwhile, America watched the buildup of Nazi power through the 1930s and saw Germany's military technology in action during the Spanish Civil War. The Nazi invasion of Poland in September 1939 confirmed Hitler's ambition to take over the world. While still officially neutral, America began preparing for war. In 1941, Douglas began delivering a military version of the DC-3 to the American Armed Forces, the C-47. The military version had no passenger seats, but had a large cargo door, a strengthened floor, and fittings to attach a hoist. The tail was modified so the C-47 could tow gliders, and it had more powerful engines. Douglas and other manufacturers built more than 10,000 C-47s before the end of World War II. Throughout the war, they served with distinction, dropping paratroops, evacuating casualties, towing assault gliders, and carrying vital cargo and supplies in every area of operations from the Arctic to the tropical jungles, and from sea level to the thin air over the Himalayas. Because they were such a common sight to the troops, they picked up the nickname of Goonie Birds after the albatrosses so common in the Pacific Islands. After the war, General Dwight D. Eisenhower said the C-47 was one of four key items that helped the Allies to win the war, along with the Jeep, the bazooka, and the atomic bomb. This particular aircraft behind me has an especially notable history. That's all, brother, was the C-47A troop carrier aircraft that led the airborne invasion on D-Day, June 6, 1944 carrying 101st Airborne Division paratroopers into France during the D-Day invasion. So it is my honor and privilege to be here today with Eric Hagen from the Commemorative Air Force. That's all, brother. It's a very unique airplane. It is the airplane that led the main paratroop force on D-Day. It had 800 planes behind it, carrying 13,000 paratroops. They all jumped out of the planes behind the lines to uh, be a part of Operation Overlord and D-Day. The C-47 was quite a versatile airplane. It was kind of like the pickup truck in World War II. It was not only a paratroop, but it also was a cargo airplane. A week after D-Day, the same planes were coming in, flying in, and uh, dropping cargo to supply the troops behind the scenes. It was also used for medical evacuation, which was critical. I've even seen one airplane used by the Navy for tracking submarines, and they had depth charges underneath wings. It made them very mobile and secret. This airplane looks great today, but I understand it didn't look that way when you got it. 
After World War II, it was sold until it finally ended up in a boneyard in Wisconsin. So it was taken from just a bucket of bolts, so to speak, back to looking exactly like it would in 1944. So Eric, it's been a pleasure hearing about That's All Brother from you. You know somebody that can take me on a walk around? Let's have Mindy do that. So I'm curious about the name. That's All Brother, does it have any significance? Actually, the name That's All Brother came from the troop carrier squadron commander and the lead pilot on board this plane, John Donaldson, and it was a message to Hitler. Like, That's All Brother, we're here. We've got a wonderful opportunity to look the airplane over before it starts flying, and you're the crew chief. Would you mind showing me some of the features of this airplane? Absolutely, let's go. All right, so here we are at the nose of the aircraft, and one of the first things that you're going to notice is these funny-looking antennas sticking out here by the nose. And that is actually part of the Rebecca Eureka range finding system. And what that was is as D-Day was beginning to happen, a small group of pathfinders went in, and their job was to mark the landing zones, and they did that with Eureka beacons. That's the Rebecca receiver, and that's what would pick up that signal to guide the aircraft towards those landing zones. So tell us about the power plants on the C-47. Sure, absolutely. As you can see, behind us. Uh, we are powered by two 14-cylinder uh, Pratt & Whitney 1830 engines. These are air-cooled engines, but I don't think that was enough to keep them cool. So underneath the engine, we got these oil coolers here. As the oil circulates through the engines, that's going to pull the hot oil down, cool it down, send it back up. And we can also cool the engines with these cowl flaps here. We can open and close them and kind of however we need to keep those cylinders in the engine cool. These are some big tires. I can assume that the C-47 could land on rough strips and grass, meadows, whatever, and it's retractable, but it doesn't retract all the way. It will retract up as far as it can, and honestly, half that tire will still be kind of sticking out. But yeah, you could land it pretty much anywhere, grass, dirt, asphalt, concrete. Uh, I know they're using Antarctica, uh, jungles, kind of anywhere. Very, very rugged landing gear. And in addition to these two uh, main landing gear, we also have a tail wheel in the back. It rotates 360 degrees, so we can make some pretty tight uh, spins when we come in to land. When we take off and land, it's in the locked position at all times, or if we got some high winds coming, we're gonna lock it in place. Great, let's go look inside. Absolutely. So here we are inside the C-47's fuselage, and I know that this has been restored to as close as you can get to how it looked on D-Day, but when you look in here, there aren't any seats and there's no padding. Tell me about that. Basically, we carried paratroopers with their 80 to 120 pounds of gear. Uh, they might've had a little padding on their own, but we're not made for creature comforts. Take me back to 1944. This thing's loaded up with paratroops. There's tension in the air, they're nervous. The excitement is electric. Let's talk about that. There's 27 seats in here, but we did not carry 27 paratroopers on that first mission into Normandy. We actually carried about 13 members of the 101st Airborne, and you know they had their full packs. So it was about a half a stick, but we also had the extra radar equipment that we took with us on that day. Can't imagine flying at about 700 feet. It's dark. Germans are shooting up at you. Uh, I can't imagine what was going through their minds at that moment. So Mindy, we've made it up to the navigation and radio station. Can you tell me a little about that? We're up here, uh, we'll start the navigation station. We've got a little scope here, we can do wind drift. You got these radar systems. We were also equipped with a G radar system, which would pick up radio signals and triangulate the plane's position. We also would have the SCR-717, which really is like an early base radar system that could uh, differentiate between land and water. On this side over here, we got this radio operators, a little tiny closet, all the modern equipment of the day in 1944, and even has a telegraph for Morse code back there. So Mindy, I know that on D-Day, they were navigating by beacons and so forth, but C-47s made a lot of long over water trips where there was no navigation aid, no pilotage. What we have here is our little astrodome. Uh, someone could get up there, there's a sextant up here, and they would be able to guide by the stars and kind of fix their position when they were out over water or in dark areas, or maybe there was problems with the radar equipment. They could always go by the old standby and use the stars in the sky. Mindy, thanks very much. This has been a real treat, and let's go see what's going on on the ramp. All right, let's go. I can't wait to fly it.
We've got C-47 co-pilot Rod Anthony with us today. So I'm sure that this is much different from the airplanes that you flew as an airline pilot. Flying an airplane like this is certainly different from uh, the commercial airlines that are all hydraulically and electrically assisted. This is the old cables, bell cranks, and pulleys. And so it's a lot more physical. It's a much heavier feel. When I saw it, I learned its history. It just became even something more critical, more important to me that that's what I wanted to do, I wanted to be a part of. Well, thanks, Rod. I really appreciate you sharing some of the information about the airplane with us and what I've been waiting for all morning. Let's go fly. Well, you're certainly welcome, Chuck, and let's go do what I'm talking about. So on takeoff, we go airborne about 84 knots, and we gently work our way up to about 120 as we're pulling the gear up. This particular airplane, even though it's large, it does fly fairly slow. Top speed when we're cruising is about uh, 155 knots. So it doesn't go very fast, but it is a very stable uh, platform and it just, just great to fly. Every time I get to fly this airplane, you can't help but drift back into that time when the airplane was being used in that war combat uh, role of how they felt, what they were thinking about. And you reflect back on that and it is such a privilege to get to fly this particular airplane. The C-47 played a critical role in World War II, but its career didn't end there. Thousands of war surplus C-47s built up the fleets of existing airlines and kick-started dozens of new ones, including Colorado's own Frontier Airlines. When the Soviet Union blocked all road, rail, and water access into West Berlin in 1948, C-47s flew around the clock to supply a city of two million people with daily essentials like food and fuel during the Berlin airlift. In the Vietnam War, C-47s that were older than their crews were equipped with three devastating GE miniguns, becoming the dreaded AC-47 spooky gunships. You know, hundreds of former C-47s continue to perform important work all over the world. And that's not too bad for a design that's almost 90 years old. Now we covered a lot, but we couldn't cover everything. And I know you've got questions and comments. So please leave them at the bottom of the video and we'll get to as many as we can. And in the meantime, you can come out here to Exploration of Flight and actually book a ride in an airplane similar to this or see a weekend showcase. Now, if you're a subscriber, thanks very much. If you're not a subscriber, please just subscribe. I gotta get back to work.